So this is chapter one of Painter and Saints of Nothing by Randy Rebay. Wisdom from on high. Seth and I are walking across the roof of my old elementary school, which is covered in a layer of round stones that knock together like skulls with each step. A charcoal overcast night sky hangs overhead and the air is warmer than usual for mid-April. We reach the end of the roof and sit down on the ledge. Seth takes up about twice as much space as me because he's basically a bear in human form. The kind of white kid who's been shaving since middle school and who's spent the last four years rebuffing the football coach's recruitment attempts. Meanwhile, I'm the kind of senior sometimes mistaken for a freshman. We settle in and fall quiet, letting our legs dangle over the west side of the building. It's the quietest side, the one that faces the unlit field that stretches out in the darkness at our feet. The playground and parking lot to the south, while the neighborhood pushes up against the other two sides of the building. Even though I'm the one that lives nearby, it was Seth who, in the summer before we started high school, first realized we could get up here by climbing the fence that surrounds the HVAC units. I wouldn't do it that first time because it was the middle of the day and I was afraid of getting arrested, but he eventually persuaded me to go back later and climb it with him under the cover of darkness. It took a few more trips before he could convince me to sit on the ledge. The school was only two stories high, so if we jumped, we'd probably only sprain an ankle or something. But it was high enough to make me feel scared back then. High enough to make me feel philosophical now. It's been our nighttime hangout spot ever since. Seth swings his backpack around so it's in front of him like a kangaroo pouch and starts rifling through. It's Friday night, so I've got a pretty good guess as to what he's looking for. Sure enough, a few moments later, he pulls out a joint grinning like he's reuniting with a long-lost friend. He lights it and takes a hit. He holds the smoke in his lungs for longer than seems possible, and then exhales, exhales slowly, letting the thick smoke unfurl into the evening. He offers, even though he already knows I'm, not, I'm going to decline. This time's no different, so he simply shrugs and takes another hit. Not that I have anything against it. My desire to smoke has not yet surpassed my fear of getting caught. The wind picks up, rustling the leaves of the surrounding trees and tossing our hair. I reposition myself upwind so I won't go home completely reeking of pot. We sit like that for a long time, sinking back into silence as we consider our numbered days. With spring break around the corner, and only a few more weeks after that until graduation, the future is a wall of fog obscuring the horizon. Oh shit, Seth says. I almost forgot. Hold this. He hands me his joint as he roots through his bag again. This time he pulls out something in a white plastic shopping bag. He tosses it in my lap, and despite only having one free hand, I catch it without falling off the ledge. Surprise, he says. What is it? I ask, passing back his weed. Open it. I reach inside and pull out a hoodie, soft and smelling brand new. I hold it up in front of me. It's a deep yellow of gold that's bright even in the darkness. And by the faint orange light from the parking lot lamps, I can read Michigan, printed out in bold capital letters across the chest. I force a smile. Oh, cool. Thanks. I refold it, stuff it back into the bag, and set it to the side. He turns and stares at me for a beat. That's it? What? Cool? Yeah, it's cool. I appreciate it. Thanks. You're not going to put it on? He asks. I can't tell if he's actually offended or not. I'm good. He takes another hit, eyes still on me. Why aren't you more excited, dude? I don't know, I say. I know I should be. Every other senior at school has been rocking their future college's apparel since the day their admissions ruled in. Still sad because of all those rejections? I shrug, lean back on my hands, and stare over the quiet field. Seriously, dude, you're dumb as shit. Oh, is shit sentient? You know what I mean. Like, out of all the schools you applied to, how many were Ivy League? I don't answer. All but Michigan and Berkeley, right? He shakes his head. Did anyone tell you about applying to safety schools? I try to laugh. Come on, man, they weren't completely out of reach. Solid GPA and test scores, plus student government. He considers this. Dude, you're a treasurer. So? Class treasurers don't get into Yale or Harvard. Some do. Maybe the treasurers who are also Olympic skiers or world champion Irish dancers or something. Whatever. You know how my parents are. I took the path of least resistance because if I didn't send in those apps, they would have said they were cool with it, but they wouldn't have been. Can you imagine their faces if I told them I applied to some school like, I don't know, like, like Central? Seth finishes smirking because that's where he's headed in the fall. You know what I mean. You don't know they have, like, 
the 93rd best comp science program in the nation, right? That is certainly impressive. He flips me off. I shake my head and laugh. When I texted my family the news this afternoon, right after I found out, I could virtually hear their collective sigh of relief at the fact that I was finally accepted somewhere. My sister M replied with, fuck yeah, baby bro, followed by like 50 exclamation points. Mom messaged, oh honey, we're so proud of you. And watch your language, Em. Well, for my dad, I got a, I mean, it's not Harvard, joke that wasn't fully a joke. My brother Chris still hasn't responded. I never wanted to go to any of those schools anyway, I say, answering Seth's earlier question. It sounds super defensive, but it's true. I'm not sure what I want to do. For some reason, that's not okay. Everyone acts like 17-year-olds who don't have their career path mapped out or wasting their lives. I consider telling Seth all of this, but he wouldn't get it. Despite his slacker stoner vibe, he already knows he wants to get his computer science degree, then become a code monkey for Google or Facebook or whatever company that becomes our new digital overlords. Besides, Seth and I have been friends for a long time, but we never get too deep into things. We hang out, play video games or basketball or whatever, and that's pretty much it. If something's bothering one of us, we never really talk about it. We give each other space until things are cool again. Like sophomore year, when Seth's parents were going through, the, through their divorce. He never brought it up beyond mentioning once that it was happening, and I didn't push him to talk about it. There were a few months where the slightest thing would set him off, like kids leaving their lunch trays on the tables instead of throwing them away, or someone failing to bag their dog's shit on a walk. But he eventually returned to his old self. If I had tried to get him to talk about it, it would have made things worse. John really was the only person I ever talked to about these kinds of things. We used to hear all kinds of things back when we used to write each other letters. Actual letters, not emails or texts or DMs. Now that I think about it, John should also be graduating this year, assuming he went back to school. I wish I, had a I wish I had a way to find out what he's up to, but I don't. I messed that up a long time ago. I stand up, walk over to the south side of the building and sit down on the ledge overlooking the playground. The swings sway slightly and the wind whistles through the tube slide. I look down at my feet as I kick the backs of my heels against the bricks. Seth eventually sits down next to me. He's done smoking, but the stench still radiates from his clothes. His parents know, but they don't care, which blows my mind. A few moments pass, and then Seth chuckles to himself. What? I ask. You know the Unabomber went to Harvard, right? Yeah. And tons of the buildings are named after eugenicists. So it's a good thing you're not going there. I sigh. He still thinks that's what's bothering me. A bird or a bat flits past overhead. A dog starts barking somewhere in the distance. The wind picks up again, but doesn't die down this time. Much to my relief, Seth finally lets the college thing go and starts rambling about this top secret mod he's been working on for this first person shooter we like to play. Without telling me what the mod does, he goes on and on about the specifics of the coding and all the iterations he had to try before it worked. None of it makes sense to me because I'm no programmer. After several minutes of this, he finally reveals that the mod replaces the rocket launcher with a cat and the rockets with babies. So, the cat launches babies, I ask. He nods, cracking himself up. That doesn't make any sense. That's the point. I don't get it, I say. Exactly. I don't get you. Seth considers this. Does anyone truly get anyone, Jay? Deep, I say sarcastically. Nothing like wisdom from on high.